Good morning. This is Bill from Adi Europa Naples on one of our last lovely waning season winter mornings. Not really. I suppose it's still winter up north. I see, you know, snowy looking cars and all kinds of trouble up there. Uh, you know, here we're having hot days, but we're still having beautiful mornings. And this is a beautiful morning. The birds are singing, though not too close. I don't hear any roosters. And I have one of my all-time favorite cars. Uh, you know, anyone who's watched my videos for years, and again, God bless you for that, and you know, God help you, uh, will know that I like Lincoln Town Cars. Uh, you know, they're one of the last true American cars. They are full-sized, body on frame, uh, just fantastic drivers, and uh, you know, I just love everything about them. I'll go into why as we go. Uh, but it starts back in 1981. Believe it or not, that was the actual first true badged Lincoln town car. Before that, the town car was sort of an option package put on top of other cars, you know, like a Continental town car or, uh, you know, some such. Uh, although the name does go back decades and decades, you know, really to the beginning of uh, car production. Uh, the original town car was essentially one of those things you saw where the chauffeur had an open uh, compartment and the, you know, people in the back had a nice closed compartment. It seemed very classist to me. You put the chauffeur out there in the rain and inclement weather while the, you know, rich guy in the back is sort of enjoying himself, giggling and smoking cigars, lighting them with hundred dollar bills. That said, the name Town Car, you know, progressed through time and was, you know, not just the, uh, you know, Ford Motor Company, but a lot of different companies used it. But Ford did gain the rights to it, and in 1981, uh, at a time of weird trouble for them, uh, they did make their first true Lincoln Town Car. Uh, 1980 was a weird year for them. They had like three different cars that were all basically the same, although they cost widely different amounts inside the showrooms and nobody knew what the hell was going on. But uh, anyway, by 1981, they kind of got it sorted out. Now, the town car is based on the Ford Panther platform, and uh, that means that that Panther platform ran for 33 years from uh, 19... Uh, 79 all the way through 2012. Uh, the final Panther was a uh uh, Ford Crown Victoria that was pretty much just meant for export. None of them were sold here domestically. It was for well, a few police cars and whatnot. And this, 2011, uh, was the last of the town cars. This is a total unicorn. In fact, by 2011, uh, if you were a guy on the street, not a livery company, uh, you basically had to special order this car. You were very unlikely to find one just sitting at the Lincoln dealership. So uh, very happy to have this. Uh, but anyway, that Panther plan Platform, you're, you're not going to believe this, was an attempt by Lincoln and Ford to downsize their full-size cars. It was actually smaller uh, than some of the full-frame platforms that came before it. And uh, it was so good and so wonderful that it ran for all those years, long after Cadillac and, you know, Chrysler and whatnot gave up their full-frame uh, rear-wheel drive uh, stuff. So uh, it also was kind of the right car at the right time, the town car. In the mid 1980s, there was like a riot in New York uh, over cab companies, and essentially what that was caused by was there were so many more people with money and wanting rides and wanting, you know, a nice way to get to and from work, and just simply not enough cars to take them. So uh, the unions, the cab companies, they allowed uh, the black car to come out. That's what they were called, uh, and what that would be was sort of a, you know, unmarked big and lovely sedan that you could have a set price for, and it would show up and take you to work or take you to the, uh, you know, Wall Street, wherever the hell you had to go, and uh, do so with a certain amount of grace and style. And even though there were a bunch of cars in that class, uh, in fact, the first few, there were even some Peugeots and whatnot, it became basically all town cars. And by the time the 90s rolled around in the 2000s, the black town car was a staple in New York City. You could go to Wall Street and, you know, walk from one side to the other, just stepping on the hoods of town cars. And uh, if you were anybody at all, this is what you showed up in. Uh, you know, and it, it was sort of a great way to do it. It's elegant without being ostentatious. Uh, it rides like a dream. It's smooth. It can handle the New York traffic because it's 
torquey, goes through potholes perfectly and, uh, you know, doesn't draw too much attention to itself doing so. So uh, the world's power brokers would just tend to show up in these things, you know, from, uh, you know, the guy running, you know, a big uh, trade firm to uh, Henry Kissinger, you know, well, I guess not Henry, probably whoever replaced him, but uh, just a staple of government and business uh, around the United States and to a certain extent around the world. Uh, livery companies love them because they're indestructible, they're easy to fix. Uh, if they got in accidents, they were easy to repair. They would go for 300, 400,000 miles with good maintenance and uh, just a uh, fantastic staple of that business. Now, again, this 2011 rare is hen's teeth and uh, the final incarnation of the town car the third generation uh, you know, Lincoln was maybe a little bit embarrassed by the town car. It still sold pretty well, although it had a declining customer base as people got older and died. And, uh, you know, the problem was you'd sort of see these things running around with glitzy, pearly paint and gold wheels and carriage roofs and continental spares. Uh, you know, every retired New Jersey firefighter would grab one of these things and retire to Florida. And, uh, of course, if you looked like Polly from The Sopranos, you just couldn't wait to make it uh, all bedazzled. So, uh, you know, Lincoln's trying to be a much more modern car company. And in fact, that could be why they put that sort of weird curvature on the roof of this third generation uh, to sort of discourage uh, aftermarket vinyl tops. Anyway, look at all the sets of keys I have with this thing. Incredible. One owner car. Get into that in a minute. So let's get inside the trunk and press that little button on there. Up it comes with the squeak of a haunted house and reveals an enormous trunk, uh, which is, again, I have to walk back to get the whole thing. Uh, this is, again, why the livery companies loved them. You could stuff tons of suitcases in there, uh, you know, all kinds of cargo, all kinds of luggage, and, uh, you know, really pick up, you know, even the most overpacking wealthy woman from an airport uh, without incurring into the cabin. Uh, I always point these out in these cars. I love this thing, the sort of anti-mafia interior trunk release where it shows a picture of the trunk open. You know, if, if you're beta, if you're you know on the street and Tony Soprano pulls up in a town car with a couple of his goons, beats the crap out of you, throws you in the trunk, they're driving off to the Meadowlands to bury you. Uh, well, they're going to be foiled because you've got this great little uh, glow-in-the-dark t handle in the back, which you pull, it'll open the trunk, and there you see the guy is leapt out of there and is running to safety. I mean, Lincoln even took it so far to have the guy running away, uh, which I just absolutely love. So anyway, nice big trunk. Everything you need is going to fit in there. And this is just so vintage America. This is the kind, I mean, I had a 79 Firebird, which had, of course, a tiny trunk, but it was exactly like this. You know, the same material, the same setup, and uh, I don't know, just really takes me back. Uh, it does suck the trunk down. All you do is get it closed and it pulls it down, sort of, you know, vintage car style. I'll tell you another thing I like about the town car is uh, essentially Cadillac had the same setup called a Sedan de Ville, which is, of course, French for town car, but too poncy. You know, Lincoln, it's a town car, it's not a Sedan de Ville. Uh, anyway, uh, this was uh, sort of a departure for. Ford with the full-frame cars. It was the first full-frame American car to put a overhead cam sort of modular V8 in it, and uh, that carried on. The first town cars, you could get an old Windsor motor. You could have a big 460 big block in it, which of course was fantastic, uh, but they did have to modernize at a certain point. Uh, this thing has about 240 horsepower, about 287 pound-feet of torque. Uh, it is the perfect setup for navigating big city streets. Torquey enough to dart around traffic uh, and, uh, you know, lovely enough to motivate the car, uh, but not completely overwhelming. Uh, and of course, you know, it came from performance roots. It's in the Mustangs, it's in the, um, uh, you know, well, I guess the Mustangs, I don't know what else is performance orientated, but uh, it's a great V8 motor, nice to see under here, made it do a simple tried and true four-speed automatic that'll just go forever. And uh, that is part of what make these things such great livery cars. Uh, you can see everything's nice under here, all been well maintained and ready to go. Now, Ford did tune the Panther platform as it went through the years, and of course, this late model is the final incarnation. Uh, they moved into hydroforming the 
uh, the front. They um, put in an aluminum brace to hold the motor. They put in a Watt style rear suspension uh, that made it even smoother. They went from recirculating ball, the stuff of old luxury cars, to a rack and pinion to make it more nimble. And uh, it became much more uh, agile as a result and uh, more lovely to drive. So uh, nice tweaking there from Ford. Another reason companies love these things, and I know I keep going on and on, but uh, they were very easy to convert into limousines. Uh, very, very simple. All you had to do was chop the uh, frame, uh, extend it to a set amount, and it would become every bit as rigid and easy to drive and, you know, solid uh, without flex as, you know, uh, the car that's at its standard length. Ford even sold cars set up for that with things like coiled up wiring harnesses. So you just would unplug them, uh, put in an extension, and uh, the whole wiring harness was essentially plug and play. So uh, the limousine guys really love these things. Uh, you can see the front end, very nice, lovely big chrome grill. Uh, it's got high intensity headlights. Uh, they brought back a hood ornament that had gone away for a few years in the early 2000s and uh, nice to see it coming back. Lovely polished alloy wheels riding Michelin tires. Subtle use of chrome. You can see it in the bumper, the grill, uh, the door moldings, the door handles around the window frames. A little signature limited badge on the back. Uh, just exactly right to be elegant without being ostentatious uh, which is what made this such a perfect mode of transport for uh, the elite who didn't uh, bother having their own cars. A little chrome around the license plate area, uh, town car. You know, they rebadged the MKTZ, whatever the hell Lincoln calls their cars now. They're ridiculous with all the initials, but uh, it's some kind of sort of crossover thing that they've turned into the town car, and to me it's an abomination. Anyway, let's have a look at the back. Okay, nice colors on this town car. Again, so many of these things became frilly, uh, you know, with all the chromey, goldy trim and stuff. This is just nice silver over black, and black leather looks terrific inside a town car. Beautiful, soft, proper leather. Very, very nice. Lovely, comfy seats. Uh, you've got a uh, nice little center compartment here uh, with cup holders, all very lovely. Uh, for some reason, this thing has the most ridiculous headrests I may have ever seen on a motor vehicle. I do not know why they need to be cartoonishly larger than they need to be. I mean, maybe it's some safety thing, but look at the size of those headrests. I mean, they look like football helmets. Anyway, you get a little map pocket there. Uh, you can put your 9mm. Uh, you know, people often ask me, uh, you know, why the hell are you always talking about guns in these cars? Well, look, I'm sure if you come from Vermont, you talk about where to stow, you know, your maple syrup, or from California, where to put your, you know, big bag of weed. But uh, I'm in Florida. I mean, you know, we drive around. I have to go to the East Coast sometimes. I mean, you better have a gun on you, maybe six. Anyway, um, you know, very traditional plastic wood that does a nice job of not being too plasticky. Nice little titanium finished uh, stuff. They resisted the urge to go full chrome. Uh, they even have an actual ashtray here. Uh, very nice, your power windows. Uh, you know, here's a place for a compact nine. Uh, everything nice and proper in the back seat of this thing. <coughs> Ford did maintain their number pad system, so uh, you just type the key code in and you can lock and unlock the car uh, without using a key. Uh, front seat, lovely. Uh, this is one of the last cars in the world. Everything was like it in the 70s, but not, not when this thing was built, where you can flip this center rest back and turn that into a third uh, place for somebody to sit. So you can fit six people in. Uh, nice big center console there, but anyway, we'll get into that. Beautiful bucket seats, or I don't know if they're bucket, it's kind of a split bench, I guess. Uh, you know, supportive, firm, beautiful soft leather, and comfortable like sitting in a lazy boy. Uh, it makes driving one of these things cross country like, uh, you know, just sitting on a cloud. Absolutely incredible. Uh, again, they went a little bit European with the stuff, which is fine. Um, you know, the titanium looking, uh, nickel looking switches, the Mercedes style seat controls. You got heated seats there. You got a nice speaker laid in to it. You got another spot to put something in here. I don't know if this opens. You kind of a big chunky cover to get in, but yeah, you can get in there and put your narcotics and such. Another little place to put switchblades. 
upgrades and uh, everything lovely. You have a gas release here and a trunk release that you can key and turn off if you need to. But uh, anyway, nice fit and finish on this car. And frankly, it better be because this one ran from 98 to 11, so uh, the longest production car in uh, North American history. They certainly had enough time to get it together. Alright, let's fire it up. And I have to say, sitting in a town car is just one of my favorite places to be. Uh, if I had to own a car and drive it every day, oh God, noise, All right, hold on. I would be very hard pressed to pass up a town car for something else. It is the uh, car version of a Silverado, really. See, hold on, see what we got. Oh, get that down. Okay, so. This is uh, one interesting thing about the town car. You have a nice little instrument cluster. It's really uh, just what you need. You got your 120 mile an hour speedo, you got a tack, you got your fuel, you got your temp. You got this weird hump up, and I have no idea why Lincoln did that. I mean, it sort of looks like a screw up in the design where, you know, it's at this level here, it's higher over here. Why? I mean, I'm sure there's some reason, but I suspect it's kind of a pathetic reason. I've had people look at that and say, what's wrong with the car? Uh, but uh, anyway, small annoyance and I'm already over it. Uh, you've got adjustable pedals down here so I can move them in or out. So if I'm a little guy, which I am, I can bring the pedals further out so I don't have to ride on top of the steering wheel. Uh, you got automatic headlights, you got your dimmer there. All very nice stuff. Uh, beautiful wood and leather steering wheel that's nice to grip. It looks good in black. Your cruise control stuff here, your radio stuff here, uh, all very proper. Uh, over here, you've got the uh, prerequisite analog clock that tells you this is a luxury car. Uh, without that, forget it. Uh, no one's going to believe it. Uh, you've got an in dash CD changer, you know, six disc. Sounds good. Great sound of this thing. You got Billy Idol going this morning. Great stuff. Uh, you got dual side climate control here. Uh, you got a big uh, ashtray and change purse with an actual genuine lighter outlet. Beneath that, another power supply. Uh, you got over here in the glove box. This is the kind of stuff I like to see if I can get it out. Again, this is a one owner car that was special ordered. And this guy kept every service record from the Lincoln dealer that uh, you know he ever had. So uh, that is a really nice thing to see and nice to come with the car. So sort of, I can't even fit them back in the book. There's so many of them. I'm gonna set them here for now. But uh, it sort of is nice to see a fully documented service history with this car. And uh, you know, rare to find them that way. I like the big column shifter there. It takes me back, you know. Uh, again, not pretentious, just perfect. Self locking doors. Uh, here's something silly to adjust the clock. Look at the size of these buttons. I guess they're just supposed to be stylistic, but I mean, it looks like, uh, uh, you know, I guess, you know, again, if you're a guy driving, it's 80, he probably needs that. All right, it's got parking sensors here beeping at us there. And away we go. Okay, so here's what the town car has. For one thing, it's very quiet. Uh, you know, maybe not as quiet as the Lexus and the S-Class at the same vintage, but quiet enough. Uh, the frame, the full frame design, keeps you so nicely insulated from harshness and vibration on the road uh, that you just don't feel any of the potholes. I mean, you know, it's missing the sporty steering feel that you can still get out of an S-Class. Uh, but uh, who cares? That's not really the point of this car. Uh, this thing's supposed to be a road warrior, you know, bringing, uh, you know, VIPs from the airport to the fancy hotel and super comfort and, uh, you know, almost like they're not in the car. You know, it's, it's just part of the trip. And it does that. It's got lots of torque. Oh, poor guy in that F-150 thinks I'm a jerk, which I probably am. But um, there it is. I mean, it's smoothing out the road. It tracks straight and true. It's the finest highway car 
you can have. Uh, again, if sportiness isn't necessarily your thing, if you just want to glide down the highway, uh, this is the car for it. And uh, it's just a fantastic vehicle in every way. And it is one that I would definitely own personally. I, in fact, have owned it time before I got in the car business, uh, you know, and I had to have a car all the time. Now it's nice. I can just drive what's on the lot. I don't have to think about owning one. But when I did, I had a town car. I bought a 1990 Cartier in my early 20s. All my friends thought I was a freak. But God, did I love that thing. And uh, that love has continued <laughs> as time has gone on. Uh, to the point that I'd sure like to own this thing. 2011, last year. Talk about a unicorn. Anyway, there it is. So I could ramble on about how much I love these things, but I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it. This is a 2011 Lincoln Town Car. Uh, miles just over 100, so yeah, you probably only get another three or 400 out of it before you have to replace it or at least change the motor. And uh, one owner, books, records, keys, sorry for the sun. Uh, it's a fantastic piece. If you have an interest, give us a call. 239-298-8000. Oh my God, that sun. On the web at aenaples.com. Thank you so much for having a look. We appreciate it. We'll see you with the next one. Take care.